Yes, my brother here has a burning question. So this question about the water and the food which I will have at home. Yes. But the protein was, uh, was not treated in the patient by the pain. So can you think that this patient had water uh, and resistance? And if so, is there a way this patient can be treated? Okay, um, thank you very much, Dr. Helen. Do you want to respond? Mm -hmm. So probably if I, um, I just want to state that this patient was on both heparin, low moisture weight heparin, and warfarin. And I think we shall infer uh, to that in the discussion, okay? And um, fortunately, it did actually cause um, effect, but probably the key thing was that we did not monitor this patient for so long, and therefore we put this child from the other end of thrombosis to an increased risk of bleeding because the PTI now was in the ranges of 100, 120. And when we saw this in one of the sessions with Dr. Namazi, <laughs> we could not believe that it was real until we repeated and it was real. So the, the facts are that the medicines worked and they went overboard because we did not monitor actively. And that's an important issue we wanted to bring out in sharing this case with you. Active monitoring if you try, if you decide to anti-coagulate, okay? So, but thank you for raising those issues. Um, just to, to also add on to what has been mentioned, I think we've gone through this, hemostasis, we have primary hemostasis, okay, once we have um, vascular injury, usually the vessels constrict, and then there's platelet adhesion, and then activation, okay? of the platelets with further adhesion or aggregation of platelets onto the others. Several factors uh, play an important role, the bone plant factor, which facilitates the adhesion of platelets onto the exposed collagen, okay? And then other receptors, sites are activated and you have multiple platelets attaching to form an aggregate, <coughs> which is a that's primary hemostasis. It's a weak plan. So that goes into the action of the coagulation cascade, which has been uh, addressed, um, introduced to us by Helen. Ultimately, it leads to the, to the formation of fibrin, the strands that make the weak platelet plant firm. Okay? And like she mentioned, if this process had no reversal elements, we would not be alive, okay? Because we would have rotting and a risk of thrombosis, okay? And she said if there is a mismatch or an imbalance, that's when you have more of thrombosis happening because you don't have the control mechanism, the natural mechanism of fibrin fibrinol lysis, okay? So that's a little uh, bit, and this is the, the graphic presentation, but by and large, it's what we have just said, okay? Injury into the endothelium, platelet, adhesion, and then aggregation, okay? And of course, the plaque is made also by red blood cells, not only platelets. When we come to thrombosis, deep vein thrombosis or vena thromboembolism, she has said it's a clot in the blood vessels. It was mentioned that commonly occurs in the femoral and popliteal veins. More common in neonates and adolescents, but also the elderly, okay? The elderly, we know that probably they are at risk for vascular uh, diseases with endothelial damage. Secondly, they are more sedentary lifestyle. 
and they may have other comorbid conditions. Okay. So these risk factors have been mentioned. They are acquired through disease conditions, much of which have been mentioned. I want to draw your attention to infections because almost all our patients have infectious conditions. And do we always look, think out of the box? It's a call on to us to think broadly. Eh? Not only think about pneumonia, not only think about only sickle cell, but what else could occur? What could this condition predispose this patient to? And lines. As I was coming in, Dr. Ido shared with me that there was there is a patient in the pediatric intensive care unit who has multiple abscesses um, through the different body organs, but the, the, the focus was an infected line. So do we care to observe uh, infection prevention even as we insert these lines? Almost all our inpa inpatients have lines. And do we care for these lines? When we are administering medication, the school sister in charge of 16 A's here, do we test these lines? Okay? So this is to us all, okay? To be cautious that this could lead into something bigger than what we think, okay? At that time. The inherited factor that I came across, uh, if you have deficiency in protein C and protein A, these are usually natural anticoagulants. So if they are deficient, then you have an increased propensity to form thrombosis. And then if you have anthropic deficiency and factor laden uh, problem. So they are acquired and congenital. In our environment, we have limitation in detecting the inherited in terms of uh, diagnostics, but the acquired are actually speaking to us. We have malignancies across 16A, 16A, okay? And all the infectious conditions. And our patient had, was immobile and had prolonged hospitalization. Diagnosing DVT requires a very good clinical approach, of course, with objective testing. Uh, my uh, dear friends, you cannot run away from history and examination, and you are taking a comprehensive history. So when we ask for the, the family social history, it's not just for, for the sake, okay? You may, as an undergraduate student, pick up some of these things which we may have missed, okay? So try to take a detailed history. Um, so um, you try to dig out what are these potential risk factors, immobility, trauma, infections, pain, <coughs> some limbs, and all that. And uh, when I was reading, I came across what they call a Wells um, validated clinical model that would help in in, in telling you and giving you a clinical probability as to whether it is highly likely to be DVT or not, okay? And it stratifies the risk into high, high, intermediate, and low. And um, it bases on clinical, but also I know that um, we shall also see the testing aspect with the D-dimer that she mentioned. So DVT is really con confirmed if you have a clinical high or intermediate probability. In other words, your history and examination are pointing into that direction, okay? And then you do uh, a Doppler ultrasound and it, it gives you a positive result of venous obstruction, okay? So if you have clinical plus the ultrasound findings that are indicative, then you are good to treat as DVT. However, if the clinical is not supportive, and then you have a negative ultrasound finding, then you know that most likely 
you have a, neg a negative DVT uh, diagnosis. In other words, it's not DVT. Because there are so many other factors that would cause a raise in the D-dimers. So I'll, I'll invite you in your private time to read the Wells clinical model for diagnosis of DVT. But they specifically indicate that those with high scores, if the patient scored more than three, three or more, would be classified as having a high score. For those who have an intermediate or moderate, where the score is two, that clinical criteria combined by positive venous ultrasound findings would be highly indica indicative of DVT, and with that you're able to treat. And equal or less than zero is actually telling you that none of these are there, okay? So if they are not there and your venous ultrasound uh, findings are negative, so you don't need to worry. Think about the other causes of pain, immobility, swelling. Could be pyomyositis, could be just an acute bleed in the muscles and stuff like that. So, in further reading, it was noted that uh, this was in an article shared in the blood journal, and they mentioned that evidence has suggested that venous ultrasonography plus a D-dimer test, if they are positive, it can measure to the contrast venography. Contrast venography, uh, is done by injecting a contrast and then they take the, the x-ray images of that affected part to see whether there are any feeling defect this go to that to that point it's a gold standard but in the child population you'll be putting these children at risk of irradiation okay and then it's, it may not be accessible in all settings because like in our patient, the patient is immobile, he's on the bed for three months. You'd need a portable, um, probably x-ray machine and stuff like that. And yet we can access, like we did, the venous ultrasound. Okay? And the D-dimers. And it measured, it had a high positive predictive value and negative predictive value of close to 100. So it measured, it is as good as gold standard okay and it's accessible in our setting okay so um, so so I just want to say that um, I already mentioned this that the D-dimers may rise in other conditions and so you need to combine it with, um, the venous ultrasonography the clinical criteria plus a D-dimers for you to form uh, a right opinion. There is this uh, algorithm for DVT diagnosis using the criteria, the criteria, the venous ultrasonography and the D-dimers. Okay? And you can run through the clinical. What it seeks to bring out is the role of the clinical aspect. Okay? Plus the venous ultrasonography, these are readily accessible. So where we have a high index of suspicion, we should actually do this. And if we can do the D-dimers, much the better, because it will help us to form an opinion, okay? So it can be accessed in that uh, di um, blood article on how to treat DVT, okay? So this has been mentioned, the treatment has been mentioned. They are the indirect anticoagulant separin, and then they are di di direct antithrombins, and then the oral anticoagulants. And uh, Helen has told us where they act. So the molecular weight uh, heparin is safer, and by and large requires no monitoring, okay? so. It is something you can use in a resource constraint setting. And it has a lesser risk for heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, which should be detected up to, uh, by around five to seven days. So, 
Why did we use papering and wafering? Okay? It's what they call uh, bridging um, therapy. Usually, uh, wafering takes a while to have the effective plasma concentrations. And so the BD usually takes five days. As you use concurrently using wafering, the oral anticoagulants, and the low molecular weight, the parin. So usually it takes about five days. And that's why we used it. But you know that we went on and on and on <laughs> with both, okay? Putting the patient at high risk of bleeding. So in long-term therapy, or uh, the vitamin K antagonists like warfarin are preferred over heparin, but then it calls for rigorous monitoring. Can we do it in our patients? Probably we failed once, so we should not try it a second time, okay? Um, I don't know, uh, Dr. Ruth, um, that is the question we still have. Um, we cannot, as we are, um, continue uh, monitoring this patient. They've been in hospital for three months. For how long are we going to keep them here? He's a very brilliant boy. He's in P5 in a rural school in Mubende. But I just want to tell you that the mother is a teacher. And this boy can express himself very well. Right now he can't express himself verbally, but he can write and he writes legibly, okay? So he, he is always telling us, the parental care team, that he's tired of the hospital. When is he going back home, okay? So the duration of therapy, initially the three to six months is mentioned. Here, I foresee that we, we are going to treat so we, we may have to decide whether to tr go on treating or we just see him at certain intervals. That is some of the, the, some of the questions that we have. Prevention probably is better. How I wish we had thought about some of these things. And this is a wake-up call to all of us. We have so many more, uh, patients who are hospitalized a long time. So this is a call, and to all of us, uh, probably beyond that particular event or disease condition, could we be putting these people at risk? Are there things that we can do? Would we call into the physiotherapist early on? And for these patients, the same questions persist. Chronic DVT, the patient is wasted away. The patient has sores for the sake of maintaining your emotional health. We do not want to share the, the picture, they are a bit graphic. Uh, he has gangrene on the left uh, middle and the ring uh, toe, and not the ring toe. Did I say the ring toe? The first toe. He has uh, multiple pressure sores. He has deep uh, septic wounds that have eaten away his brutal area on the right. He's very sick when you see him. Uh, those of um, us who are not very stable emotionally, you may not. <laughs> so uh, be okay. So we do not want to show you those pictures. They were a bit graphic. But there we are. He has nutritional issues. He has a, a chronic heart problem. That is not going to cure. Okay. He has pain that is infectious. When he cries in pain, you cannot help. You also cry in your heart. Okay. This child touches, has touched all of us. And the bigger question, and Dr. Namasi, I will request you to comment on this. Some words of wisdom. For how long? I'm throwing back a question. <laughs> Should we, Auntie? You can have um, some um, words of counsel, and after that, I'll invite uh, some special people to tell us. Thank you, Dr. Philip, and thank you.
home for coming for our grand round. Uh, I asked a question and then he asked. Once he came. <laughs> <laughs> but I just wanted to emphasize a few things that DVT is rare in pediatrics. It's very rare. I think it's like one 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 thousand. But uh, it is common in neonates and adolescents, and these are people that you're going to see in your practice. The most common risk factor in pediatrics is a central line, and we are seeing this more and more frequently. In the ICUs where you'll be working, in the cancer ward where we are working, we are using uh, central line. So whenever a child has a central line, think about DVT. We also have a special group of children who have a high risk of DVT, and that is children with sickle anemia. So think about it, and we see it very, very often. So um, family history is also important. For example, who have some uh, familial uh, uh, pro, uh, risks for thrombosis, so you need to take your history very well. So choice of treatment, Dr. Philip and the group have uh, really told you why we choose what we choose. Okay, you start heparin alongside with warfarin. Because warfarin is going to take you about five days to, to start working. Long term, warfarin is the treatment of choice because I mean you're not going to put someone on injections for life, but it needs monitoring. There are complications of uh, DVT, which you need to know about. You can get a PE, it can recur. Okay? So when you get one episode of uh, thrombosis, you can actually get a second episode of thrombosis, and then you can get the post thrombotic limb syndrome. Okay? Even if the, the, the thrombus uh, is, is no longer there. The leg continues to swell and be big, so you have to really look at it and make sure you try to prevent it using uh, compression stockings. Um, I need to comment about the dimers. They are good. If they are positive, it does not mean you have DVT. If you are negative, if they are negative, you may go to sleep. Okay? So they're usually positive in DVT, but doesn't mean that when you have D dimers which are positive, it is DVT. Now how long should we treat? So the principal, Dr. Philip has already told you, if you have an identifiable risk factor and you have dealt with it, at the minimum is three months. So don't treat someone for DVT for two weeks. The minimum is three months. So three to six months with an identifiable risk factor. For example, pregnancy, uh, a central line. Okay, so when you remove the central line, don't continue with that treatment. If you do not have an identifiable risk factor and a child is, you know, has a DVT, the, the teaching is prolonged for life. So uh, for this child, it's tricky because we continue to have the risk factor for DVT. We have an uncorrected cardiac disease. We have an immobile child. We have a septic child. So I will continue to give this child and population until at least I can deal with the thing that I can deal with. Get him mobile, treat his sepsis. Now how do we treat him? Of course I don't know how you're going to get the heparin injections. I don't know if you have enough supply. If you have enough supply, you do. You do the heparin. But I, uh, warfarin needs monitoring. Okay? So you need an either at least, at the very least, every week. It costs between, I think, 90,000 and 150,000. So, yeah. But we, we, have, we have children who are on warfarin in our sickle cell clinic, whose INR we do every three to four weeks, not more than four weeks, and they're stable. So once we can get this child on a stable dose of warfarin, we can actually see them every three to four weeks, if we can get them out of this uh, state. Okay. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Namazi. Um, for those who don't know, Dr. Namazi heads the Pediatric Hematology Oncology Fellowship Training Program. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so at this moment, I wish to invite our guests from the palliative care uh, department here at Mulago Hospital um, to share with us. Remember I told you we are kind of stuck and we are hurting. How I wish we had called them earlier, but better late than. So this is their time. They are going to tell us who they are. <laughs>